Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro condemned the political violence seeking to disrupt peace and security in the country. The National Police of Ecuador reported a bomb threat alert at the bus station named Terminal Terrestre in the city of Guayaquil as violence increases in the nation ahead of Sunday's presidential elections. Libya's health ministry reported that clashes between rival militias in Tripoli left residents trapped in their homes and unable to escape the violence. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from Adresso Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Venezuela, President Nicolas Maduro condemned the political violence seeking to disrupt peace and security in the country. During his speech on the program with Maduro, more, the president condemned all types of political violence, referring to the decision of the Attorney General's office to appoint an official to investigate the death threats against Elsa Solorzano presidential pre-candidate for the opposition party Citizen Encounter, Encuentro Ciudadano, the head of state ordered the Minister of Internal Affairs to activate efforts for the government, also to investigate and provide the necessary security services to the opposition leader. Likewise, Maduro condemned the attacks of Western media which want to establish fascism in the country by means of lies, manipulation and violence. The big media wants to disrupt the social and economic life of Venezuela. They want to disrupt the political life of Venezuela. They want to spread fascism in Venezuela through hatred, lies and violence. They want to spread fascism in Venezuela through lies, hatred and violence. A person of perverse Machiavellian cocktail, they want to do it. But we will not allow them to do it. The Venezuelan head of state also assured that the United States is not a safe country for investments and demanded the immediate return of the national oil company Citgo, together with the $4 billion of debt for the years of seizure. What is being carried out against Citgo, against Venezuela, is simply something that can be done to any country in the world at any time. The United States is not a safe country to make investment, to buy companies, to have economic activity. But the United States gave Cinco to the extremist right wing opposition and they all applauded and they are simply stealing a company that costs more than $12 billion and that belongs to Venezuelans. This company gives at least $1 billion of net annual profits. This company has $4 billion from these years of kidnapping. On Tuesday morning, the National Police of Ecuador reported a bomb threat alert at the bus station named Terminal Terrestre in the city of Guayaquil, capital of the province of Guaya. The police reported the discovery of a suspected explosive device outside the terminal and specialized units of the police are in place conducting their respective procedure. A week ago, there was also a similar alert when a suspicious suitcase was found on one of the platforms of the terminal, but the threat was later discarded. Guayaquil went from 50th, for, from 50th place in 2021 to the 24th in 2022 in the ranking of the most violent cities in the world, published last February by the Citizen Council for Public Safety and Communal Justice of Mexico. Starting this Tuesday, several universities in the city of Guayaquil, southwest Ecuador, suspend on-site activities due to the criminal violence affecting the country. The assassination of a presidential candidate and the arrest of a criminal leader for his alleged involvement in the crime has forced several universities to return to virtual classes. Following the seizure of the city by numerous motorized vehicles and the demonstration of force by the inmates of a violent prison demanding the release of the leader of a gang known as the Choneros, the University of Guayaquil, the Catholic University and the Literal Polytechnic University decided to take the measure as a way of protecting the lives of the students and other personnel. On Tuesday, a blackout affected Brazil's federal district and 25 of the 26 states of the South American giant. Roraima, in the extreme north of the country, was the only state not affected by the blackout. The Ministry of Mines and Energy reported that the blackout occurred at 8.31 a.m. local time. 
At first, it indicated that the National System Operators Database registered an interruption of 16,000 megawatts of load in states in the north and northeast of Brazil. Later, it pointed out that the southeastern states were also affected, detailing that the interruption was caused by the opening of the north-southeast interconnection. The cause of this event are still under investigation. At 9.16 local time, power was restored in all the affected regions. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Telesur is the voice that speaks up in defense of the people of Latin America. Welcome back from the South. In the United States, a Montana state court on Monday ruled in favor of a group of young people who accused the Western state of violating their right to a clean environment. In a climate lawsuit, District Judge Kathy Sealy ruled as unconstitutional a state law that prevents agencies from considering the impact of greenhouse gases when issuing permits for fossil fuel development. The case, held against the state of Montana, brought by 16 plaintiffs ranging in age from 5 to 22, has been closely watched because it could bolster similar litigation that has been filed across the country. Julia also an executive director of the non-profit Our Children's Trust, which represented the plaintiffs, hailed the ruling as a great victory for Montana, for youth, for democracy, and for climate. On Tuesday, a wildfire in France that triggered the evacuation of more than 3,000 people from holiday campsites near the Spanish border has been contained but remains dangerous. According to regional authorities, about 450 firefighters backed up by surveillance aircraft were still battling the flames south of the city of Perpignan. With the exception of 350 to 400 people, the holiday makers had been able to return to their campsites on Tuesday. The fire broke out on Monday afternoon and swept through 500 hectares near the village of St. Andre Soret and the seaside resort of Argels. So 17 firefighters had sustained light injuries and one was admitted to hospital after a fall, but there are no casualties. 30 houses had been damaged along with a warehouse and a campsite. Authorities on India confirm on Tuesday that the death toll rose to 65 while dozens of people are missing due to landslides and floods caused by heavy rains in several regions of the country. According to, the, to an unofficial report, the northern Indian state of Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand are the worst affected areas. Indian Home Minister Amit Shah pointed out that the National Disaster Response Force teams are engaged in relief and rescue operations along with the local administration and assured this monsoon season had the highest number of incidents of downpours or very sudden and destructive rainstorms in the past 50 years. Hundreds of migrants have arrived on the small Italian island of Lampedusa within a few hours on Tuesday. Most of them are from Sfax, Tunisia, according to the Italian news agency ANSA. Many of them were rescued by the Italian Coast Guard, with others rescued by non-profit rescue ships and other small boats arriving independently. Among them were young women and children. Italian Prime Premier Giorgia Meloni, whose right-wing government includes an anti-migrant party, had enlisted the European Union's help to forge an accord with Tunisia in a bid to stop the migrant boats in exchange for economic and other aid. The number of migrants arriving by sea in Italy this year was expected to surpass 100,000 on Tuesday. According to the United Nations, an estimated 2,175 people have lost their lives trying to reach Europe by sea this year.
Belarusian Defense Minister Viktor Krenin warned of the possibility of a direct military confrontation with NATO in the near future. Speaking at the Moscow Conference on International Security, the senior official noted that many heads of state behave under Washington's control, push for war only to see profit. In this sense, Krenin emphasized that the possibility of a conflict with NATO is becoming quite obvious. Crane also said that the latest expansion of the North Atlantic Alliance is also a kind of colonization of new territories in order to use their population in a probable war with the East. Regarding to NATO's expansion, the minister assured the world East should be understood as a set of nations willing to resist the West. This Tuesday, at least 13 banks in Russia start testing real transactions with a digital robot. The experiment tests a number of basic digital robot transactions, such as opening and reloading e-wallets, citizen-to-citizen transfers, and payments for goods and services. Those during the first phase, the average number of participants in the project will be 600 individuals, 30 trade and service companies from 11 cities. With the introduction of the digital robot, Russia will have three new payment instruments, cash, digital and the national cryptocurrency. Among the advantages of the new payment method are its security and the absence of commission fees for transactions. Mali's military leader Asimi Goita revealed on Tuesday that he recently had a phone conversation with Russian President Vladimir Putin to discuss the current situation in Niger. In a message shared on his socials, Goita stated that Putin emphasized the importance of a peaceful resolution to ensure stability in the Sahel region. Western nations feared that Niger would go the way of Mali, where an earlier coup led to the involvement of Russian group Wagner in counterinsurgency efforts. Putin urged the restoration of constitutional order in Niger. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. In Afghanistan, Taliban marked the second anniversary of the return into power with a public holiday celebrating the takeover of Kabul on August 15, 2021, and the establishment of what they describe as security across the country under an Islamic system. The new government remains unrecognized formally by any country, while the international community continues to debate how and where to engage with the Taliban authorities. Most Muslim countries have rejected Taliban's stand on women's rights since they have stopped Afghan women and girls from working or traveling in the absence of any male guardian. The Taliban hopes for foreign recognition and the lifting of sanctions. Meanwhile, their poor management of the country has dramatically reduced poppy production in what has for years been the world's biggest source of opium. And marking the date in a very different fashion, Afghan women in the Pakistani capital Islamabad state protests against the Taliban rule in Afghanistan on the second anniversary of the group's return to power. Two years that we uh, write our uh, voice and, uh, and also slogans against the Taliban, but still now the international community are uh, silent and they do not uh, took or take any uh, serious decision against the Taliban. Uh, once again, we can hear and uh, we shout and we loud our voice and uh, we want to the international community to pay attention to the situation of Afghanistan. In this context, China outcry U.S. counterterrorism efforts in Afghanistan as a complete failure, stressing that military interventions are futile if the aim is to bring up democracy. Two years ago, the world witnessed the moment when the United States hastily withdrew their troops from Afghanistan. The lesson from this change of situation in Afghanistan is very profound, and it is still worthwhile for the world to reflect on it today. It shows that the United States military, political and counterterrorism efforts in Afghanistan are a complete failure, and that once again military intervention, political interference and attempts to bring democracy don't work. On the contrary, 
it only brings turbulence and disaster. On Tuesday, clashes between rival militias in Tripoli, the Libyan capital, left residents trapped in their homes, unable to escape the violence, the country's health ministry reported. Fighting broke out between the 444 Brigade and the Special Deterrence Force late Monday afternoon, according to local media. Tensions erupted after the head of the 444 Brigade was allegedly detained by the other force at an airport in Tripoli early Monday, made reported. The health ministry urged the warring sides to allow ambulances and emergency teams into affected areas, mainly in the south of the city, and to send blood to nearby hospitals. A hospital source also stated that two people had been killed and more than 30 injured. Niger's group leaders recalled their country's envoy in Abidjan on Monday after remarks made by Ivory Coast President Alassane Kutara that they say that amounted to praising armed action against Niamey. Military rulers denounced Kutara's eagerness to see this illegal and senseless aggression against Niger come to pass, taking into account Niger's West African neighbors' intention for a possible military attack to reinstate ousted President Mohamed Basum. On his return from a summit of the Economic Community of West African States in Abuja on Thursday, Utara said the heads of state had agreed a military invasion should start as soon as possible. He added that Ivory Coast would contribute a battalion of between 850 and 1,100 troops alongside Nigeria and Benin. The excessive threatening remarks made by His Excellency Alaksane Utara, President of Ivory Coast, relaying and taking on board with notorious aggressiveness the conclusion of the extraordinary summit of ECOWAS on August 10, 2023, concerning measures and sanctions against Niger and its people. These sanctions, which are both iniquitous and illegal, and whose hastiness attests to the manipulation orchestrated by certain foreign powers for an on a bold agenda are far from weakening the determination of the people of Niger to bring about the change necessary for the country's recovery and the safeguarding of its people's interests. On Tuesday, Ethiopia's lower house voted in favor of the state of emergency declared by the federal government over violence in the Amara region. Clashes between members of the Ethiopian army and a local militia known as FANO erupted earlier in the month in towns and cities across Amara after months of tensions. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government imposed a six-month state of emergency across Amara on August 4, and several cities remain under curfew, although violence is late last week. The unrest revived fears about the stability of Africa's second most populous country, seven months after a peace deal ended a brutal two-year conflict in the neighboring region of Tigray. We have come to the end of this news brief from you can find these and many other stories on our website tresfinglish.net. Also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Tres for English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.